Welcome back. Actually, just welcome. Some of you, welcome back uh, to the Artist Pro Creators Corner. I'm glad you guys can join me today. Um, this should be super fun. Okay, I want this to be. I don't want this to be as luxury as some of you guys who've done Artist Pro might have remembered. Uh, and in fact, I kind of don't want to be doing all the talking this time either. Uh, I want to keep this a roundtable sort of discussion. Hence, the corner kind of component. Uh, what the point of this whole thing is? We're all isolated. We all know that. Um, I think all of us come from various community backgrounds. We have other people who've supported us through music. Our friends make music, that kind of thing. Uh, and I mean, at least for me personally, just not having that, I don't want to say take some of the fun away from it, but it takes some of the fun away from it. I really like the idea of having discussions with other people who can empathize with what I'm going through on a multitude of levels, obviously creative levels, but I think everyone in this virtual room is career oriented as well. So I think the more people you surround yourself who are career oriented, the better it is for your overall approach to music, if that's what you want to do. Some people want to make music and just keep it for fun. I think everyone here kind of wants to take it one step up. Uh, and and your, where your moral compass is in regards to is that a good thing or a bad thing is a whole other conversation. I've had a lot of those conversations actually. Some people think music is just for the art form itself and other people are like, well, if I can make money from it, why not? Uh, so that being said, uh, we are living in, uh, I hate to use this term, but it is an unprecedented time because it really fucking is. Uh, there have been plenty of other times in the history of music when like disruptions have occurred, namely through technology. Anyone who's taken Artist Pro knows that technology typically is the, is the thing that disrupts the industry. Uh, and technology, not just in terms of what we think of it now in terms of digital tools, but dude, even the printing press was a form of technology that was disruptive. Okay, CDs, Walkman, of course, Napster, streaming, uh, and the industry has always been trying to catch up. Uh, unfortunately, music is usually the, usually the guinea pig when it comes to this, and also sometimes one of the more prevailing case studies from it. But this is a weird one. This is a weird one because our whole livelihood, at least in the current model, right, the current model of music isn't so much on the recorded value of music. We'll get to that, how it still can be. But it's usually the idea that music is the lost leader, right, to attract an audience for other monetization purposes. But right now, there are no audiences right now. And I think that affects people on a multitude of different levels besides the professional ambition, you know, uh, side of it. But I want, also want to talk about creatively uh, how it's affecting people. I also do want to talk about almost like pandemic aside, the overall mechanics of just, you know, what is progress today in music? I almost said success. I didn't want to say success, but what is progress uh, in today's music landscape? How do you measure your progress? Uh, and what are some deceiving ways that that might be in front of you? And what are some actual tangible ways to do that as well? Uh, but before we get into any of those things, I do kind of just want to hear from you guys a little bit now uh, in terms of what, what when the pandemic kind of hit, what were your initial reactions to how you're going to adjust and how you've adjusted uh, from that? Let's start with Daniel, uh, if you're cool with kind of kicking that off. Why don't you go ahead and, and lead that part of the discussion? Um, I was actually entering my last quarter at Icon when the pandemic hit. So it didn't really affect me too much because I had stuff to do the whole time and I was already not really working that much. It's really kind of affecting me now because I'm finished Icon and I'm trying to figure out what I want to do. My lease ends at the end of the month and I'm trying to decide, do I want to stay out in LA where there's not really much opportunity right now and it's really expensive or do I want to go back home to the East Coast for the next like eight months to a year while we figure out what's going on. And yeah, and like talk about maybe, real quick maybe. the factors that went into that. That's a very great place to start. So is it worth staying in LA? First of all, people have had that question before the pandemic anyway, right? Uh, you know, I think a lot of people here are LA based and we come to LA for a specific reason, obviously. But what were some of your deciding factors, Daniel, in terms of like why LA would make sense even now versus maybe why it wouldn't? Are you talking about to stay or to Just, not? To stay or to go. Yeah, what were your deciding factors there? I, I guess I wish that... Um... I had just been working more before because now like looking for a job is really hard mm -hmm. because there's so many people out of work and the jobs that are out there right now are don't really pay that much. And so I'm like, if I feel like if I stay, I'm going to be grinding two jobs that 
like pay minimum wage in order to just scrape by. Whereas if I go home, I could live rent free. And even though it's not like in the hub yep. of LA, I feel like the money that I would save, I could use to like pump into my career for like marketing and promotion and all that. And so it's like, it seems like it would be a investment wise. It would be smart for me to like take a step back and go home for a year. But it, it, my, the, my ego is like, no, you'll be like quitting by not leaving or by leaving LA. So I'm just yeah. like torn internally in that. It's interesting. Sense. I mean, look, well, first of all, you're looking at it through the right lens, I think of either or, right. I think we can all kind of see that the, his, his, his lens there is just growth and progress. Like if I, if I spend time here, yeah, I can't be playing shows or anything, but there's a different kind of investment, right? Potentially you could be surrounding yourself with other people who you could be meeting, et cetera, but we're not really mingling right now, are we? Right. That's another kind of thing to kind of keep in mind pre pandemic. Of course, like that's something you would think about. I can still, you know, raise my social capital while I'll be draining my financial capital. But like, as you can see, even, even with this format now, everything is virtual <laughs> at yeah. the moment, you know, and in terms of having just general capital, forget to invest in your music career, but just to live, man, you know, if you can't make those ends meet here, it's, it, it, we're all starting behind the, fin the starting line in, in any kind of degree when you choose a creative career. Right. Uh, but adding a financial burden to that is only going to add to the intensity of it. So you have to ask yourself in terms of, you know, the growth here in LA, look, I, I don't, does anyone really think that if he leaves, he's quitting, right? Especially given this mentality. No, <laughs> right. You're doing it for the, for the betterment of your career for that matter. Uh, if anything, it's a sound business decision. Should you take it? I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong or wrong one here. Uh, what do you guys think? Who wants to kind of chime in and help Daniel in terms of his decision making? I mean, I think it's not a bad idea to go home. Uh, I just watched that thing Sippy did on a uh, icons Instagram and she talked about how much money she was able to save. And, and Daniel, like you said, just pumping that type of revenue into your marketing and promotion stuff would be so awesome for you as an artist. And right now, like as was saying, like everything's electronic anyways, like you don't have to be meeting people in person. You know what right. I mean? It's all over the internet. It's all over Zoom calls and stuff. So, like, honestly, if I thought there was a time to do something like that to move home to the East Coast, it would it would be like right now. That's yeah, I sense. actually watched that sippy thing, and that's kind of what sparked my like, man, maybe that is really what I should do. Yeah. Hmm. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Give their two cents. Willie, you got something? Oh no, no, I'm just like here listening. To be what honest. would you do in that particular position? What would you do? Honestly, I would pretty much take the risk. Um, it it do sound rocky because you know it's it's like okay, you have so you're wanting to you know use that money to really help you with your your music, and basically now like nowadays, you know if you don't. You, you you release music and you know you don't promote it or you don't advertise it it's not really going to get out there mm -hmm. but you know you're you want to save money to you know be in a home and you know it's like a you know which way which way so it's i'm pretty much listening to be honest yes yeah. it's, it's tough yes all right i mean i'm biased you're talking to a marketing guy <laughs> yeah. okay so just keep that in mind grain, grain of salt but check it out Daniel, and like everyone here, all of us, frankly, we're always in audience building mode, right? We're always trying to build an audience. Well, first of all, like there's a, there's a trajectory, right? Like everyone wants fans, but step back. What do you want before fans? You want listeners. Step back one more time. What do you want? An audience. An right. audience pool, right? Like how do you position yourself in front of an audience right now? Well, obviously there are no live audiences. So everyone, where's the market right now? Where are the eyeballs? Where's the attention? It's on their screens. Okay. Do you need to be in LA to get on people's screens right now? Okay. Do you need to be in LA to get resources to help you do that? For instance, I don't know. You don't, don't, in fact, don't disclose any financial stuff, but let's just say you move home. You just you, actually, you said enough. You said rent free. We'll just leave it at that. Rent free at home. The money that you would have been spending on just waking up every day in LA, could you perhaps spend on a dope camera? Could you perhaps spend on some nice lighting? Could you perhaps spend on some Facebook ads? 
Could you perhaps spend money on submit hub campaigns and, and other, other things of that nature? So in terms of being, you know, in LA, it has all kinds of benefits, right? But you don't have to be there necessarily to grow an online audience base from which there is a listenership, from which there is a fan base, mm-hmm. okay? Um, you know, even just using myself as, as an example, I, I have a project that's what, two months old, if that, no, not even two months old. Uh, 1.57 million streams as of uh, yesterday, supposedly. Uh, people buying merch, et cetera. And I played one show, nothing. It's all online. It's all the play, playlist promotion, Facebook marketing, et cetera. Uh, I have a listener base of which there's a small fan base, but there's some fans already. Uh, I don't need to be in LA to do that, but I already had the investment in terms of gear to film things and put things out and put money in campaigns. Uh, that's been very, very vital for me. So in, in this particular example, I would lean towards what makes the most sense and where I'm at in my stage of my career. And for you, it sounds like it's just building an audience, getting real traction. And I think the way to do that is investing in other things, perhaps than just waking up in LA to the sunshine. I know it's fucking nice. I love it, but it may not make the most sense, you know, overall. And you can always come back, dude. <laughs> you know, yeah. you could always come back. Max, what up? Welcome back. Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. What would you do in this situation? You either move back home and save some money, invest in other things, or would you fork it out and stay in LA? Man, if if I moved back home, I would just be 20 minutes east of LA. So I'm here. I'm here to stay. Theoretically, all right, if you weren't (laughs) so close to LA. You know, I mean, um, I had to jump in and out because apparently my internet was trash. But um, I heard something about, you know, he said there wasn't a lot of opportunity in LA. And he and then I started thinking about, well, yeah, there are some cities where they're open and maybe some stuff is popping. Um, and so you can make some money out there or create some buzz in a different region um, or at least network in a different region. So I was like and then I started thinking about it. I was like, hey, you know, that's not actually not a bad idea. Um, maybe make that happen. And as you said, come back to L.A. when you need to, um, when when stuff starts to happen, especially if the live aspect is where you know, you make everything happen. So it's not a bad idea. It's not the end of the world to leave LA and it'll right. always be here. Right. And then Danny, you, again, you already went to Icon, like you understand the idea of building a community, right? Especially a localized one where people from all over the country, sometimes the world come to a place like Icon or LA uh, to build that social capital. I mean, look, any success that I'm starting to see on my very early music stuff right now, yeah, of course it's marketing stuff, but a lot of it is relationships that I've not only just built over time, but have really flourished in a place like LA. So that's something to keep in mind. So on that note, what do you think your move is going to be? I mean, if, you, if I had to put you on the spot, which I am. <laughs> My gut tells me that I should just go home because I was already going to spend the next six months writing to get maybe 12 to 20 tracks and like launch the like branding career in 2021 to kind of like push. So I have like consistent releases and it just seems like if I have more money that I'm saving from not staying out here, I'll be able to pump it into that to try to make that get more traction when I do that. And if I'm just barely scraping by spending $1,200 a month on rent out here, it's like, it just seems like a waste of money when I'm just kind of like probably going to be sitting inside and I could do the same thing on the East coast. That's the beautiful thing about the era we're living in, guys. The laptop that you're watching this, you know, hangout in is, this, is your music studio. You know, you don't got to uphand and move everything. I'm sure you, you all have gear, obviously, but, like, for the most part, like, especially if you're making electronic music, you know, it's all electronically done here on the laptop. So, uh, okay, interesting. Now, who? Uh, let's see. Uh, Willie, talk to me real quickly about what was it like going into the pandemic for you and how you adjusted uh, coming into it and even where you're at now. Oh, man, it was – I feel like it was um... – pretty tough because I was at, for side tech, I was at my college when this hit. I was in my second year and um, it basically forced me uh, out of college. And uh, right now they're doing the onla- online thing. But to be honest, I'm not really like an online person. I'm more of like an in-type person when it comes to learning. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm pretty much waiting that out to see if they're going to open it back up. Um, right now, I'm just mainly focused on music. I am working. I do have a job. But um, I feel like it forced me to, you know, really get in the studio more and work on my music and perfect my craft more and then definitely work on my advertising and um, endorsing my my brand and myself. 
because you know I'm I mean people now that you know when I first started this music thing I I never knew of like I I mean like different type of artists working with different type of artists now that you know when I first started you know I couldn't even really get a hold of so you know it it definitely forces you to tune in with yourself um, study yourself more and um, just learn a lot more. Yep. So now the school you're going to is it a traditional uh, um, academic place or is it is it a music school? It's community college. Okay. Gotcha. So it's gotcha. like, uh, I guess, tri- could regular college. Traditional. By the way, did anyone, any of you guys either get laid off, lose your job, lose part of your income because of this? Did anybody? Um, Daniel, you did? Yeah. You got laid off? Uh, yeah, I was working at a, like a food festival thing, and that obviously stopped. And I was never able to get on unemployment either, and I never got um, the stimulus check either for some reason. Why? So why? I've, I've been struggling. Did you ever find out why for either of those? No idea. The the unemployment thing out here has been really tough. Uh, like I'll call the office daily, and you just get disconnected because yeah, it says there's too many people calling. So I'm like, I don't know. It's brutal. But everyone else, no, wasn't really financially affected by it too bad. Unless was anyone? No. Nah. My uh, my yeah, wife like, uh, has an awesome job, so I was super fortunate to. And yeah. she can work from home, so she's the breadwinner, and I'm just bumming out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely feel I felt it, you know, at least uh, all my touring clients gone in like one swoop. Like, hey, man, we love you. But sorry, you know, uh, that sucked. Uh, but at the same time, I was like, I mean, what the fuck I can't, what am I going to say? Like, I get it, you know, like, especially at the time for those guys, I was doing a lot of tour marketing. Uh, and then, I mean, the biggest heartbreak I got to say was was one client they had it's the, the palladium right here the palladium uh back to back two sold on us uh, two sold out shows and it was the day that newsom said like hey stay at home everyone can't go out and like they had to cancel the show that day mm. two sold out oh. shows the palladium. that sucked everyone was fucking heartbroken i mean i remember because uh, i'm very solution-minded <laughs> and i'm like all right dude all right it's all good we're gonna do some live streams okay we're gonna do donation based things we're gonna make specific merch we're gonna play with it and at the time like i mean it was like I, I learned something. <laughs> Timing is everything. Okay. Like it was the right idea. It was very solution oriented, but the manager was like, I don't want to fucking hear how you think we're going to make $600,000 from this touring income that we're supposed to get on live streams. And in my head, I'm like, I'm just doing damage control, you know, but it was very much mm-hmm. like, shut the fuck up. Don't talk to us right now. Like, <laughs> uh, until the live streaming thing really, again, we all saw start taking off and people started doing donations. And I didn't want to do like the whole, I told you so, but I'm like, you should have been on it sooner. Uh, and then of course they made merch about, it was like the, the sabotage of their tour. I forgot the campaign that they did. Uh, some sort of tour, like cancellation merch. And the fans were so excited. You know, they were even considering pushing back the release of their album that was going to come out like three weeks later because it was supposed to be tour supported. But the, the fans were like, just release it. We'll even buy it on iTunes. And they did. You know, they, they made like 40 grand in a day on merch, which, again, is not going to recoup the touring loss. But like, hey, it's just it's better than just fucking sitting around being like, oh, no, what was me? Uh, so I felt that my uh, my composer, uh, Tom Hockenberg, Junkie Excel, I mean, I, yeah, that affected that because all his films, the way he gets paid is on Milestones. Right, you deliver certain parts of the project as the film films and develops while the films stop, you know, uh, felt in many ways. So it, it's one of those things that like we're all going to remember because even if you didn't get sick or die or anyone you know like that, you felt it somehow, you know, like some one way or another, it, it definitely affected you. But I like the idea, Will, you mentioned about um, creativity, you know, yeah. creativity, like, I mean, being kind of locked in the room and right. being forced to work on music did something to you. Can you talk about like what happened there? Um, well, when this actually hit, um, I was already working on, you know, finishing up, um, an album, well, a a single, which is like three songs, three songs, single, but, um, I was already done with that. And since this hit, you know, I really couldn't go nowhere. So like, I'm in my room, I'm like, man, what am I going to do? Just work on music, just do yeah. music. And like now it's just to the point where I'm just up at like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., like finishing songs, finishing demos, um, working with other artists, just like is 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 like really doing a lot and you know, putting more effort into you know what I'm doing now than you know what I was doing before then this even hit. Mm-hmm. Um 
I'm doing shows, like I'm doing like live streams in my room, DJ sessions in my room. So that's another creativity. You know, I, I got into DJing uh, recently. So that's, that's like another big up for me. So it's, it, it definitely helps. Yeah, did it, anyone else experience that uptick in creativity or at least desire to like sit down and make music? Anyone else experience that? For a time, I think like when it all first started going down, but, uh, but what, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> You know, time goes on. I find myself it's it's harder. Yeah, it's uh it's harder to stay creative and motivated. Motivated, um, especially like I said, I'm on the East Coast now, uh, and just like not, I've only been here for a month, and we're going back home soon to LA. But if I feel like everything's moving in slow motion out mm -hmm. here, you know, I'm so used to like the LA pace of things, and all my friends are hustling and not being in that setting is kind of starting to wear on me and like being home, I'm like more comfortable. I'm like, Oh, I don't need to work today. Or like, Oh, maybe I'll do that tomorrow. You know what I mean? And it's hard to not get into that mentality of, of thinking. Of course. Of course. Jeff, what, what happened to you creatively when, you know, just when this whole thing kind of hit, did you feel the urge to kind of make more music, be more productive? Did it, did it, did it take it out of yeah. you? Yeah. So it was like a big wave for me pretty much like I would say like when it first started in January I was still I still had a job um, at Whole Foods and I recently um, stopped working there and when was it like two or three weeks ago but so it was just riding waves of like big creativity moments and then like not as much creative moments because I was still working just trying to figure out the schedule a little bit better and then it kind of just ruined my headspace a little bit and then I kind of just got back into it and was able to make music and mm. pretty recently like this just this month so interesting so, but but like my labor waste was made in january and like i was making music in february too so that was a better moment for the then for sure so yeah and oh we have a special guest in the building tomas is here mr habitat himself <laughs> hey guys what is up dude hello what's up up, Tomas. Good to have you here, dude. Yeah, great to be here. Sorry, I'm a little late. That's all good. We are up. talking pandemic's effect on creativity. We're just gonna go straight to you since you walked in here. When the pandemic went down and the pursuing months after that, did you feel more creative, less creative, more productive? How did it affect your output? Um, you know, it was really funny because right when the pandemic was like just about to come in and things were just about to close, I ended up getting like two really big opportunities right at that time. And mm -hmm. it was kind of like dry before that. And then all of a sudden, um, I got these two really, really big projects that took up like a month and a half. It was like a scoring gig and mixing for a documentary. And nice. so the whole, the whole time, like the pandemic was happening, but I was so in like this mix of this big project that it just kind of like, I feel like it just happened. And then by the time it was all over, like everything had changed. Mm. Um, yeah, after that, I feel like it, it's, it's been a little, like, I feel like it's been good in some ways. Um, I mean, yeah, like, I don't know about you guys, but my life, like, it changed, but it didn't change that much because I was still inside cooking up beats most of the time anyways. Yeah, right. So, yeah, I feel like it was, uh, I didn't really see a huge change on my product, like, how much I've been able to create but I have tried to make the best of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think it's been like, like I've had, I feel like I've been making, having more time to make music, For sure. um, but I haven't necessarily like finished more stuff. So I'm not really sure <laughs> if that's just me or, or, uh, uh. or it's like the creativity or the spark. Yeah. And, but yeah, well, that's kind of my, in terms of output, I mean, not only anecdotally from, from people I've spoken to, for myself, because I'm actually putting out a lot of music out now. But I mean, just just look at like someone like like a company like CD Baby. I remember when the pandemic really went down, and I used them almost exclusively for all distribution. Like they were so backed up, where normally it takes about like three days or so to kind of get a track to push through. And it was taking three weeks, and they're just like we are just overwhelmed. There are so many people just releasing music right now, 
And of course, that might be due to maybe they think the only way to kind of keep momentum forward is to kind of just having content in the form of music mm. uh, for other people. And this, I, I fall into this category as well. Uh, you know, we're starting to get good playlist streams and like the name of the game there is continuous output to get on as many playlists as possible. So algorithms going to see that you have high output, release radars, that whole thing. And some people are making good money on just streaming right now, you know, because mm. they're getting all these, uh, these good playlists. But in, in many ways, it's like, you have to ask yourself, like, what, what what happened? What was removed that allowed me to kind of stay in here? Was it this whole, like, oh, fuck it, like, nothing to do out there. I'll just make music. But is that why we got into this in the first place? To, like, to stay occupied, <laughs> you know, to stay busy? Or does anyone kind of want to speak to that? Like, what do you think happened, at least psychologically, by the pandemic happening, that some people were just like, fuck it, I'll just make more music? What do you guys think? I mean, I, if I, I could say something, um, I think there is a part of that. There's a lot, a lot of people who just nothing else to do. Might as well make music. Um, if this is what my calling is, then I should just, if I have free time, this is what I should be spending it on. Um, but it's also a matter of like, what can I do? And existentially as creators, it's just a matter of like, what can I deliver to an audience? And at, at this point, it's just music. Well, then that's what it is. Uh, me, I come from a branding and marketing side on social media and the internet. So I'm always trying to um, guide my artists to say, like, you really need to tap into your audience and say, like, what do you need right now? Like, if it's not music, what is it? Because uh, maybe I can help. I need, I need to be of service in some way. And artists need to pivot. It's like, if I can't give you, if you don't want music right now, if that's not what you want from me, like, what do you want? And let's work together to, one, keep as, as an artist, keep my value in your eyes high. And whether you just want to have a conversation with me as, as an artist, and then fine, like that's how I can give you something, you know? Um, and so I think um, if artists are making music right now because they think that's what the audience wants and if that's working, keep it up. If the audience isn't biting, then it's just time to pivot and just do more, you know, just social marketing, social interaction with your audience. Um, yeah. And of course, I think, look, the, the skeptic or the, um, the jaded person might be like, hey, man, I can't pay my bills on, you know, on people's like likes on Instagram and stuff like yeah. that. Right. But I think I don't know. I, I don't have the whole like we're fucked mentality. I think like now is more than ever a time to kind of keep laying that foundation because look, we will come out of this. Mm -hmm. It's the weird thing. I, that's By the way, it's another kind of side note. Like people are saying we're living in a historic moment. Uh, but like, yeah, when you read history books, you know what's going to happen at the end. So you're like, wow, cool story. But like in the middle of you're like, uh, great, how does it end? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's, it's a, little, a little different there, obviously. Um, but yeah, I don't think that that just means like stop everything. You know, at least just speaking for, speaking for myself in this case, like I took this as an opportunity just to finally stop fucking around and like just launch my artist project, you know, and kind of seeing how that went. And I was kicking myself in the ass, like, why did I wait till a fucking pandemic to do this shit? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, for whatever reason, it took that kind of uh, impetus. Yeah. And on that note, by the way, I want to share a screen real quick. Um, I always say anyone who's ever taken artist pro knows I've always said like never underestimate people's affinity, you know, for what you're doing. You might think you only have, I don't know, like 500 Instagram followers of that might be like a hundred, like really true fans, but dude, you never know how people are going to be really, really into you. So I always say like, you've got to give them opportunities. So can you guys see the yeah. screen here with the website? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah. So like, you know, I remember when Ben Zugel was like, Hey, we just added this donate feature to the websites. You know, you can go on the website now on, on under every page, there's a donate feature. We've just unlocked this for everybody. I'm thinking this will never work. Who's going to just rent, fucking randomly donate to me? I'm getting donations. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. I mean, look, I'm not going to say I wouldn't do it because no, it's not, that's not true because I listen to podcasters, YouTubers, they give away free content all the time, but I'm like, ah, oh, I fucking love you. Thank you. But the large reason why I do this is because they consistently provide me new content. Every Tuesday night, there's a live stream that I tune into. Every Friday, there's a major release of some kind. And I can see that the time that they're putting into, they tell me about their story. Hey, I have a full-time job, you know, my mom was sick, blah, blah, blah. Like, they're very open and transparent about what's going on. So I'm like, dude, 10 bucks a month, PayPal, you know, and then they shout me out every, every podcast, for instance. And I, you know, I feel like I'm part of it. So like giving people an opportunity, that's one example. Uh, paying attention to your audience, Max, is very important. Like, like you mentioned, I remember when I first put out uh, here, I'll show you guys real quick that this track on my Spotify for artists here. Uh, it's always the song that you least expect, right? That does like the best. Uh, I wrote a piano song. I literally wrote it like the morning of guys. I did three takes, three takes. Um, and as of now, I mean, yeah, the streams are fine, but like, look how many saves, like 
you know, 15,000 saves. I'm thinking like, why do people like this song so much? <laughs> the point where people were messaging me like, hey, do you have a tutorial on this? Do you have sheet music, et cetera? And I'm thinking like, sheet music? No, <laughs> I didn't plan on making sheet music, but I did. And now it's on the site now after like, you know, literally popular demand. And I posted about it today, okay? This is important, I posted about, about it today, but I added it yesterday. And my first sale came yesterday which meant people were actually going to Spotify and hearing this and like, where's the sheet music? And I'm thinking, I fucking blew this. I should have <laughs> this thing out. You know, people were clearly clamoring for it. So when you go to my Spotify, I already know you probably found me because you liked that damn piano song. So the spotlighted thing is uh -huh, sheet music available on my website. Go get it right now. You know, just paying attention, just listening to your audience is so crucial there. But Max, back to your point, I mean, we're both marketing guys. Uh, the, the whole point of the consistency component is that you've got to give people a reason yeah. to feel uh, compelled to support you, um, obviously, but you, you never know how you might be affecting someone in that that's regard. So point. I think that's, that's a true point. It's part of I it. think I, I started as an artist and I've always struggled with the existential question of like, why am I doing this in the first place? Um, who gives a crap about what I'm doing? And especially if you, I think you're right. Consistency is huge. People appreciate consistency because they feel like they can always, if you're on every Tuesday night live, it's like, okay, at least I can always come to his stream and like, and, and enjoy it. But as the artist is like, well, who, I mean, there's only like two people watching every week. Like, why am I being consistent for nothing? Uh, but it builds up, it builds up momentum. And, um, uh, you, you made a good point. Just be consistent. And I think something will come out of it. Yeah. Besides talent or skills in other areas, like if I could always just like pray for one other attribute and whatever I'm doing, like number two would be consistency. You know, like all the YouTubers, mm -hmm. I, I live on YouTube. I, I follow a lot of YouTubers. Uh, and I followed people who were like, you know, you look back at their old videos and shit, like they're awful. <laughs> they're awful. <laughs> so consistent, dude. Yeah. You know, over the course of X amount of years, they have that one video or that one thing that like, finally get some traction because they perfected the format after a while, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you bring people along the way. Yeah, li listen to anyone who's got a successful show or anything like that. Just like go to the archives and listen to the early stuff or watch the early stuff. It ain't good. Oh my God, I love doing yeah. that so much. When you go back and you see like old episodes or old uh, YouTube videos and it's just like trash or boring yeah. and then you see the progression, like I get so inspired when I see other artists that do that. Um, and it just points to that uh, consistency. Just like, that's it. Like Finding your process. Yeah, you know? exactly. I'll be open with you guys. I'm trying to do the same fucking thing with this, okay? Like we have, what, eight people in today. That's cool with me. You guys are here. This is the first one. Thank you. I hope you stick around. But I'll be releasing this on YouTube, you know, as often as I can. I'll take the audio and release it as a podcast. Why not? Yeah. Maybe one day I'll look back and like, damn, remember when I was doing that during the pandemic in my fucking like home studio? We were all on Zoom. That's legit. There was no format. There wasn't even giving any guess. You know, like that's, shit like that's that. Legacy, like, uh, I'm starting now. Totally. You know, like the, the whole point is that you begin now and offer like genuine, real value first, and hopefully, yeah. like you know, we're we're gonna, we're gonna do that here. Right. Yeah. Anyone want to chime in with, with some of that on the consistency note? I mean, I can't. I can go on for days for that on the consistency thing. Anyone I can chime in. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like for me, what has helped is just like making a schedule um, with just mentally and just uh i just like writing down or even like on your laptop somewhere just hourly just scheduling out your days um with when you make music um any business stuff you need to do um things like that um and just always just being on top of it just knowing like when when this needs to be done this track needs to be done mm -hmm. when you need to like be consistent with making music just separating your sound design sessions or whatever it may be from your writing sessions that's what i tried what i'm trying to do now um to make better music so that's what has yeah. helped me so yeah and this is no different than any small business owner by the way right when you work for a company you have a you have a set things to do you're a spoke in the wheel right there are repercussions if you don't do it if you have a job things will happen when you're your own boss when you're a business owner like all of us are there's no one telling you to do that kind of stuff, which has its share of freedoms. And of course, for those who are not intrinsically motivated, can have its share of downfalls. Uh, organization can be key to that. And look, anyone who knows me knows that I used to be, well, I still kind of <laughs> uh, militant about organization. But ever since I started the artist thing, by the way, ironically, I've been giving myself a lot more fluidity in my schedule. Yes, I have certain things to do, but I don't 
Not anymore do I say, it's 10 o'clock, time to do sound design. It's 11 p.m., time to start mixing. I, I just can't do that anymore. It's a balance, yeah. It completely is. But to your point, though, here, I'll do another screen share. Mm -hmm. This is something that I've been doing since, like, man, I don't even know, like, since I can really remember. But, like, having a calendar, but then color coordinating everything. <laughs> yeah. everything here and scheduling reminders five minutes before 10 minutes before you know it's super super important to me and i do it for like every yeah. single category of my life frankly mm -hmm. and everything goes to my phone i can see my calendar ahead i have everything for music releases ahead of time and that's just like my personal calendar i mean i can i can pull up the uh, the social calendar for all my artist stuff as well um but you just need something i think right at least for me yeah. just something mm -hmm. to kind of have as a, as, a, as a guideline or trajectory something to follow that Look, some mornings you may not feel like doing them, but if it's in the books, it's in the books for a reason, typically, right? Does anyone talk about how they schedule things or how they coordinate themselves that works for them? I used to schedule my sleep. How my, I, <laughs> I, I, I used to schedule when I wanted to sleep, when I wanted to work out. Um, but one thing I've learned about all those um, philosophical, motivational, and uh, gurus, they talk about like, if you, if you yes, yeah, setting a habit is great. Keeping up with the habit is fantastic because the productivity that comes out of it is great. But if you have this gym reminder, it's in your schedule and you skip that thing like three times and you keep skipping it, it's just, it's really bad for like your internal uh, accountability. It's like, well, if I can skip this, I can skip it all the time. Like I skipped it yesterday. I'll just skip it again. Yep. So you really, you got to check yourself and be like, I can't skip. It's not good to skip. So if you set something for yourself, you really got to be on it or else you can kind of jack, jack up your internal accountability. Mm. And it's mm. a slippery slope, isn't it? Yeah. Very slippery slope. How else do you guys stay organized with your stuff? Uh, um, for me, uh, you know, I pretty much made myself um, a, a, in, like mental schedule. Like usually, you know, I wake up, you know, eat breakfast, hop in the studio, you know, get, catch me a little break, play the game, go get some exercise, hop back in the studio, go to work, yada, 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 come back home in the studio. If I have like a long album that I'm working on, I'll probably be up, I'll probably limit like the hours I will be up at night, probably to around like four, five o'clock in the morning. And then, you know, if it's a long album, I get up like early and, you know, work on that album, finish working on the album and then, you know, really start my day off the way, you know, I did yesterday. But um, it's pretty much like a repetition for me um, at this point, like just like a blatant repetition yep. because it's, it's, it's something like I definitely had to get used to because, you know, me being in the studio, you know, all day, literally every day, is something that I did not used to do when I first started this. This is something that, you know, just came with repetition and, you know, I just started getting into the groove of it. And now I'm just like, okay, man, studio time, break time, this, that, back in the studio, album done, finished, and then promote. So it's, it's definitely like a- Yeah, a and on that note, by the way, um, I don't know if you guys experienced this either, but I definitely did. Once I got a little more regimented about well, this room specifically, something mm -hmm. I noticed something happened. Something definitely happened. Look, when we start making music, we gravitate to it for mostly for the fact that it's fun to do, all right? And I, I can't stress enough <laughs> how much you need to hold on to that, right? Uh, but usually I would come in here before I really got serious with music as, you know, a just a, just a, it's a playroom. These are toys. I like to play, okay? And I noticed that, like, that's kind of how I approached the professional side of it. You know, I would come in here like, do I feel like playing? Nah. But like, I don't know about that. So now when I have literally, to Jeff's point, like a release schedule of things, right? Like I have to do these things. It also helps when you have labels or like, hey, how about that pre-master? <laughs> All right, so that's another conversation. Uh, but when you have like things to do, okay, to look forward to and ahead of time, you come in here a little more tactile, I think. You come in here like, all right, like I need to finish this specific song. And we've all been there too, where you have a melody like, ooh, this is a good melody. It's not good for this song. But let's start a new project. Command N, a new song. <laughs> like, no, hey. No, finish this fucking song. <laughs> Come in here a little more uh, regimented because now it becomes kind of like an office, right? We're here for output, to deliver things. In my opinion, that's what a producer does. You produce things, okay? You don't just make songs and have them storm on your hard drive, in my opinion, frankly. But then there are other times when I'm in here, I'm like, no, 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 no. Remove the pressure. Let's just play. 
okay? Because I can't really just make art from this whole like must produce output, must produce output. You know, I have to play, I have to play and think, that's nice, keep playing. No, nothing's been as good as that last thing. We're done, let's get into output mode now. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Uh, especially as I have a calendar to look forward to. Like I need a release there. Fucking September is empty. I have nothing for September. You know, right now I have schedules all the way through September, all the way through the end of August. And now I have a lot more time, therefore, to focus on playing. I'm not under the gun. I have to get a release out. I have to get a release out. And these are releases, as you guys who's, you know, follow my music stuff, it's going to come out every two weeks, you know, and they're all done. Mastered, done. Cover arts, submitted. Distribution, done. You know, so now I can focus on the marketing side, the promo side, the playing side. So it definitely helps to have that schedule ahead because you're not in here when you feel like it, you know? Can anyone relate to that once they got a little more regimented, like the studio became a little more about an output room? Tomas, yeah, you got sure. some thoughts on this one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing is, uh, like, when I first moved into this space, I have a studio area, and the studio area is only for making music or content. And so I kept it, and, um, you know, obviously I was, like, kind of lucky that I could have a desk that was just for, for producing, but that means uh, no YouTube, no social media, no yep. marketing, no emailing, no yep. nothing. Only music or creating content. And so that what that does for me is uh, like I just tend to get distracted very easily. But I know when I sit down over there and like, and sometimes I'm like, nah, like I'm not really feeling the music this time. And then I'll, I'll find myself kind of like scrolling to YouTube out of habit. But I can be like, no, man, this isn't. That's not where you do this. Here. Yeah, and then close that. And so, so for me, that, that's been helpful. So little things like that where you just can, you can associate different places or different like times with, yep. with that is mm -hmm. like you can kind of train your, your brain to, to embrace that. And so it just knows. I love that. I, I take it to an extreme. Not only do I have a separate room, I have a separate computer. This is actually the music computer. You know, I have an office. Nice. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have a three bedroom. Like that's an office. That's the bedroom. This is the studio. You know, like I, when, whenever that light is on, like, all right, you know what that means? <laughs> you yeah. know? Like I'm yeah. very regimented about that shit. Like there's on this computer, there's like nothing but just content shit. There's like not Microsoft Word, not on here. You know, nothing. <laughs> I can't keep it very bare. This is just the music shit. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's good because you can build that. You can build those habits over time. And then eventually they just start to work for you. Yeah, and that's the key, right? Finding what works for you. Like we're all hearing yeah. from each other's perspectives, but you got to find your own cadence, man. Yeah. Right. Find and then uh, one other thing too is, is uh, something that I've been doing, and this was recommended by a friend because I was, I was working on music all the time and it was getting, I just felt kind of like that feeling you were talking about where I was in there and I just kind of felt like a robot. Like, like, when, like I don't even know, am I just like, trying to output stuff and uh and then she recommended hey you should just have like an hour a day or you, know, you should just have a certain amount of time where you make music and it's complete free time mm -hmm. so i've been trying to do that so i set aside like 30 minutes a day a um, couple times a week that's absolute complete free time like no matter what's on the deadline no matter if i'm late on like trying to send something to a client like that time is very strict to just you, if i just want to make bloops in serum fine like mm. literally anything is on the table and what that does for me is it keeps my you know when i sit down at that desk um if it's too much work i start to feel like i sit down and i'm like oh this is i feel like i'm at work that fun so yeah if you, if you keep the fun in there it's going to keep your association fun play which is kind of like the ideal for us creatives. Mm -hmm. now everyone in here for the most part i mean everyone here's a producer right everyone produces music Okay. I mean, just to give, just to kind of hark on Tomas' point one more time. I mean, my background, I wasn't a producer. I was in bands first. I always played the drums, a very visceral instrument. And once I started production, you know, obviously I'm more into that side of it, but I got burnt out and I got bored because I was like, I look at screens all day and I'm on my fucking keyboard. Like, and now I go do that when I make music, you know? So I, I, I also wanted to pivot from drums to piano, which is why I really gravitate towards just playing a thing playing a thing you know so i think that's something to keep in mind is that you know musicians right they have musical instruments and they play first so every band mm -hmm. i've been in we don't sit down like all right give me a all right we're gonna here's our tempo all right give me four chords you no know, it was just more like wait what are you doing hold on do it again right, mm -hmm. playing along hey man we got something record it lay it, lay it down you know like that was the genesis of like how i would write music and that's still how i write music to this day 
And I think Tomas's point is great because you can use the, the DAW as an instrument in that regard and just fuck around, man. Especially if you have hardware too, right? Little, little machines and Ableton push and all that. That's, that's definitely part of it. Yeah. Anyone want to chime in on that, on the idea of playing for production or anything like that? Um, with me, like, I, I definitely, like, you know, acknowledge what he said there because it will be, like, times where I would, you know, come home after work or, or something and I will be, like, just upset. And I would literally – I'll come home straight to the studio and whatever I would make, I would make off of emotion, like how I would feel. And, you know, I would sit there, like, for, like, two, three hours just listening to this beat. I'm just like, okay okay, okay, I need something that's aggressive. And I would just pick random stuff and see how it would match up. And if I didn't like, I would scrap it or just mix it up with something else. And, you know, that's that's where, you know, I say, you know, what he said, touring around in the studio, like that's, that's something that I could really relate because I do do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for some of my music, um, you know, you may hear, you know, some little, like little doo -doo 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 -doo, or some like, that's like with me toying and I just said, man, okay, I like that. I like that idea. And I pretty much incorporated that, you know, into some of my songs. So yep. I, I understand where, you, where you're going with that. I, I, that's something I definitely do. You got to learn your cadence. You got to do your way. What works for you or what doesn't work for you. A little side note. That's also partially why I stopped smoking weed such a long time ago. Hmm. Because, like I would be making music and I'd be high as balls and I'd have something <laughs> and then I would just play. I'm mean, like, oh my God, this is so great. And the next morning, I'm like, what the fuck was I on? Like, this sounds awful. Like, I had no output. I would just keep playing and playing. I was like, all right, that's it. No more, no more smoking weed <laughs> while I'm making music. Before I go on to the next topic, guys, you really have 10 more minutes. I did want to just really quickly follow up on two things. Again, if you've done Artist Pro, you've seen these before. But content calendars, I can't find my latest one right now. Um, this is how I do all the scheduling for my releases. Every tab here is a different release. I, I moved it to another sheet. I can't find it right now, but uh, as you can see here, the whole like month basically is scheduled out. I try to do two weeks in advance. So when it comes to what you should post on social media, it all has a purpose now. Everything in pink is like the tent pull stuff. So the single music video, uh, another single, uh, let's see the making of uh, playlist. You know, so everything here is like adding context, supporting, right? So you can structure your content if you actually map it out. Now, if you want to take this one step further, th this is probably overkill for, you know, an average independent artist, but there is an app called Gain, Gain app. I use this for one of my clients actually, where it's, it's pretty dope. You can schedule, po you can link all your accounts and instead of like kind of writing these things, now you can actually schedule all of them and then publish them. This is really great though for more like agencies that I've had experience working with because not only can you draft posts, you can send them for approval. So part of the reason why we do this for clients was that, you know, it's all Google Sheets. The manager can look at it, the artist can look at it like, yeah, I wouldn't say that. Nah, please don't do that. Change the link here. But now it's like, you go straight to people's inboxes. You can approve things and, and post things on the fly. You can link all your accounts here. So if you have a label, two artist accounts or something like that, uh, it's super useful. You can export them as PDFs and, and sheets. It's, it's super useful. So that's just two ways, either Google Sheets or uh, an app called Gain. Now, I did want to bring up another thing real quickly. I don't know if you guys saw this. I posted it on my personal and on the Artist Pro socials. Uh, Mark Mulligan, a very well-respected music technologist, had a great article this week from Media Research. If you're not following Media, please do. They are a great re music uh, tech research firm. Uh, I mean, I've been saying this for a long time, but he, put, he coined a great term to it, the velocity game, right? What he's talking about there is that right now, the name of the game for a lot of music people is just Velocity, output, release, 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 release. Obviously playing to the playlisting and streaming mechanics. Uh, and the fault lines here is that releasing more music than ever before to meet the accelerating turnover of content, right? The idea that you release content and like, dude, by the end of the week, it's, it's done, it's over. It's, no one cares anymore. You know, the demotion of the artist. This is, okay, it's a little extreme, but I totally get what he's saying here. Once the centerpiece for consumption, you become a production facility for playlists. Oh, wow. I love that term. A production facility for playlists. I, I can definitely speak to that. Then the royalty output. Like, the idea here is that, like, if I listen to your album, Willie, you know, like, the whole way through, should I be paying you the same per track stream as someone who's not even paying attention, listening to a meditation, you know, like, calm pad loop or something like that? Like, why, did, why are those the same, you know, uh, economics there? Uh, if you've not read, read this article, definitely check it out. It's on the Artist Pro socials right now. 
Uh, but it also speaks to this idea of like, where are we, where do we go from here? You know, like right now, this is the consumption, uh, which is the way people are, are consuming music. Now, I'm not going to say the reason why I've seen it's, let's see, what is it as of today? Uh, you know, relatively good numbers is because I've, I've catered to this because I absolutely have. I'd be lying to you if I, if I didn't tell you I've been catering to uh, playlist mechanics. And look, okay, look, since April 7th, that's how many streams I've gotten so far. But I think a lot of it has to the fact that I kind of cater to this concept here. So to give you an example, the latest track that I'm going to put out, actually it's going to come out next month, but I'm, I've already submitted to playlists and they've already accepted it. But for instance, like, look at the track length, less than three minutes, barely, but less than three minutes. Three seconds in, like we're already there, no intro. Uh, and it ends on a really fucked up, like non-conclusion note. So check it out. It literally ends like that. <laughs> it ends like that. The idea is that you go back and play it again. It has that replayability. Uh, I am not saying this is how you should make your art. However, if you want to look at past, right, the past and the history of just the music industry, you have bands that would put out albums or artists that would have beautiful seven, 12 minute songs or like, you know, really niche kind of sounds. They'd have those radio edits, those radio friendly songs, the singles, if you will. I really mm -hmm. think in some ways, if you're going to be putting out output, it makes sense to make things that are a little more playlist friendly, not exclusively playlist friendly. Okay but have something that at least gets you in a position towards that audience base, i.e. a playlist has an audience. Spotify may have, you know, a million followers on a playlist. And from that comes your listenership. And some people will become fans because for whatever reason, it's subjective after all, that music really spoke to them for whatever reason. So I bring that up just for you guys in terms of how you schedule your releases uh, to, to consider, you know, the new radio edit or the new radio single in, in this case, for most cases is really just catering to playlists and getting people to click that like button and save your tracks early, right? Like get to, don't bore us, get to the chorus, but now it's never meant more than it does now. Like just get to it, man, you know, and, and don't overstay your welcome because <laughs> you're literally introducing yourself to everybody, everybody right now. Mm -hmm. um, who wants to speak to that? ADD generation. I mean, first of all, <laughs> I mean, one minute songs, I'll, Tierra Wax Project with the, what, what was it? Nine songs of one minute. I loved it. I wanted more of every song. Mm-hmm. And you probably um, played them over and over again. Over and over. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those are all streams. Which, which is great for the algorithm. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point. What do you guys think of this? Is anyone like annoyed by that? That's mm -hmm. something that I've been toying with because I grew up on a lot of like punk and hardcore music and a lot of the songs sometimes are really short. So I've been writing songs with like intro verse, drop, and then it ends. And like a lot of times people are like, oh, you have, where's your second drop? You have to have second drop. And I'm like, why? Just play it again. Yeah. Just play the song again. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We should just have a snippet at the end, replay this song. <laughs> like, so uh, there's no confusion. Like, play it again. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I went through, just out of curiosity, I went through on Spotify and uh, my brother found like, if, if you go to your page on Spotify, it'll show you all the artists that are like you. Yep. It's fascinating because it's like artists I've never heard of before on my page. So I went through and listened to a bunch of them. But one of the things that came up was the number one thing that I thought about a lot of the songs was like, I was like oh, this is pretty cool, but it's too long. Mm. Like that's kind of the, the, the main thing that came up with all these other um, underground songs that, you know, were, were on the come up. And that was like the biggest thing for me. And so what I took away from that was like, okay, I don't want to be the one where other people say that it's too long. Mm. I think there's a place for long songs. And if you have a journey to tell, like a story, you should do it. But I think at the same time, like, like Hasham, I don't think there's anything wrong, wrong with making kind of shorter, like, just like you said, it's kind of like an introduction, almost like you're in a room with all these people. You don't want to just keep talking while yep. you're introducing Totally. Them. Wait till they come to you to tell a story yep. and then you can do that you know, with an yeah. album or something. I really think like to be completely, uh, again, this, I'm only saying this because everyone here is career oriented. Okay. But I really believe there's something to be said about the idea of complete creative freedom. Okay. Yeah. 
Of course, we're all independent artists for the most part. We have creative liberties, creative freedom. Does that mean you should, every track should be this nine minute, like, listen to me, I'm gonna have a two minute long intro because it's gonna be more emotionally fulfilling, okay? I'd like to think that as you grow your audience and you've reached this point where there is more demand than supply, if you think about it from an attention standpoint, from an attention standpoint, and people are expecting things from you and they're looking forward to your trajectory, then I think you might have a little more liberty to expand the, the I guess, the, the parameters of your creativity, I think. I mean, you should always be expanding yeah. them in terms of that, what you're delivering to the audience. Right, like, all right, since I have, you know, 1.5 million monthly listeners and all my shows are sold out, like, okay, maybe I can take more liberties with my experimentation, perhaps in terms of what I'm doing here. I don't think you should do a hard pivot all the time, obviously, like gradually bring us along. I use that analogy, right, of the, of the bandwagon, right? Literally the wagon, if you turn too sharply, people tip over. <laughs> but if you just guide, gently guide us along, you know, some people are like, oh, we're here now? Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> and that's okay. You know, uh, there is a great podcast. I'm trying to look it up. First of all, have you guys heard of that podcast, Switched On Pop? Mm -hmm. chance? Yeah. It's a good one. I think it's actually NPR. I'm trying to find the episode specifically. It was sometime last year when there was a great episode on just the playlist like economics and how pop songs in general have changed. Of course, what we're talking about here, no intros, or sometimes like the intro is the chorus, but like it's the synth line of the chorus. So like, it yeah. already hooks you from the beginning, for instance. Uh, I'm not saying this applies to, you know, everything, but like, I mean, there's a reason why the pop format has adjusted so, so dramatically. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it has a lot to do with just playlist mechanics. Uh, once I, if I find it, I'll email it to everyone. But I remember hearing that being like, this makes so much sense. Um, okay. Anyone else want to chime in on the playlist uh, side of things or at least, you know, not, tailoring, I guess, their music a little bit to uh, playlist consumption. Mm. Max, there's something in your mind, I can tell. Uh, Who? Uh, oh, sorry, my bad. You got something to say about that one? I, mean, oh, I, was, just gonna, I was gonna say, uh, just it's a slippery slope. As an artist, you don't wanna dictate your work by the market necessarily, but as a, as a business person, yes, you do. You wanna tailor your product to the market. Yeah. Um, so. Just got to toe that line. I know. It's, it's weird, right? Because on one hand, it's like you can sit there and be like, I'm not bored. This intro is great. You know, but then I think it really, you got to send it to a lot of other people for feedback and objective feedback too. Don't send it to just your mom and your girlfriend and your grandma. They're going to all, so that's great. <laughs> you know, that's why it's good to have like a community of people. Be like, hey, dude, right. objective feedback. Did you get bored? I send tracks to friends all the time. And people are like, oh man, I don't know anything about music. I'm like, that's exactly why I'm sending it to you. <laughs> if I send it to producers, like, hey, all right, like the, the highs, and eh, it's a little muddy here. I'm like, I don't want to hear this. I ask very basic questions. Were you bored ever? What part yeah. did I lose you? Was it too repetitive? Just very basic stuff. You when know? did you yeah. hit that board button? Bored. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, did, did I lose you anywhere? Yeah, and also just a different audience. Like, uh, you know, you have fans who are going to be like, I want to hear every second of every song. But then you have people who, you know, when you're a new artist, you're trying to look for new people. And when you're looking at new artists, it, people's attention spans is really low. Mine's is low. Like my attention span is very low when I'm looking at new artists because it's, it's kind of hard to listen to a bunch of songs that you're not really connecting with, looking for something good. And so it's almost like you're giving us, you're doing someone a favor by just getting to what they might really connect with right away. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this goes also to formatting of like the album. Like, really, you kept bringing up the album, the album, and I got kind of nervous. I'm thinking like, you're an unknown artist. You want people to sit down for like 40 minutes to listen to you right now? Yeah. You know, it's all about the single kind of component there. Um, any other things to mention on that, guys, before we wrap up? This is an, an only an hour uh, discussion, but any other yeah. things you guys want to bring up? I just want to say one more thing. Yep. Uh, in terms of, it, it's an introduction. Early songs in your, in your catalog are an introduction to you. It's like a relationship, really. Um, I'm not going to meet someone and like give a whole spiel. It's, that's what the elevator pitch is, right? And then you, you talk for one minute, say a one minute song, and then you see what the feedback is. And they say, I like you, go ahead, keep talking. Or here's, here's my feedback. And then you could talk for a minute and 20 seconds. You know, it's a, it's a literal, not literal, but it's a figurative com, um, conversation. Actually, I think it's very literal in, in lots of ways. I'm gonna pull up a quick screen share for anyone who's taken Artist Pro, you've seen this without a doubt. But I always say like the fan relationship is very much, uh, it's like, it's like me, me, meeting a friend, right? Like when you meet someone, 
They yeah. just, they're a stranger first. They're a user of another platform. They're only there, you're only talking because you both are on Spotify. Just like you're both at this party because you both know Dan or something right. like that, right? They're right. only aware of you. So like, hey, what's going on? My name is Tomas. Can you want to leave this party and like, can I sell you some shit? And like, whoa, 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 whoa. slow <laughs> the fuck down, dude. You know, uh, then the natural progression is we get to know you, but we're not like your fan. I mean, we're, we're an acquaintance maybe, you know, some people yeah. might reside in this area, but then eventually we may come to like or love you and then you're a fan, but then eventually we trust you and want to support you. Now I don't mean trust in terms of just like giving away your bank information, but like for whatever reason, like you speak on my behalf, whether I need to wear your merch to let everyone know I fuck with this whole scene or this artist or whatever, or I use your music to speak to my, to my friends and family, whatever it might be. So it is absolutely that journey and it happens psychologically, but you know, Max, to your point, even from a visceral standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, right? The approach is absolutely the same. We, we've all been in positions where we've gone to all of these tiers. Sometimes we just skip to maybe here or here, but it all exists. It all exists and it's all part of a broader marketing funnel, which again, if you take an artist pro, you've seen all these things already, right? We all, many people just start here, the largest part of the funnel, and then we work our way down ultimately mm -hmm. to the point where they're supporting us. But a Thanks. lot of things have to happen here as well. Thanks. Word up. Okay. Uh, well, I would say ladies and gentlemen, but boys, <laughs> uh, this has been Creator's Corner, the first one. Did you guys find this useful at all? Hopefully. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, word up. I mean, I'm going to keep doing them. Maybe not every week, but maybe every other week. Mm -hmm. uh, stay tuned for emails from me for that. I'd love to have you guys back. I'm going to try to actually make them all specific topics as well. I mean, I like an open dialogue, um, but I like the idea of coming prepared with something specific to talk about. Uh, so again, this is recorded. If you want to watch it back or share it with friends, you can. Um, we're probably going to do it. Yeah, I think not next Thursday, but the Thursday after that. Probably do another one of these uh, and I'll probably bring some guests to do, all, do, do a whole Zoom thing at some point as well. Um, but if you dug it, tell a friend or two, come through. Uh, and I'll try to send some links to you guys uh, of the stuff that we're talking about, especially that Hooked on, Pod, uh, Hooked on Pop uh, podcast. That was super cool. So I'll try to find it and send it to you guys uh, as well. Otherwise, thank you for joining. Get back to making music, doing what you're doing. Uh, I'll talk to you guys online or catch you in two weeks. Peace.